Hello and good morning to all of you exquisite human beings out there. I hope you are all feeling well rested and ready for the weekend. I know Halloween is technically past, but I still feel there's much more spookiness to explore. And plus, I do have one other thing to be grateful for today. Not to toot my own horn, but it is my birthday. I'm officially 26 and no longer on my parents' insurance. A sad, sad day in the life of a first worlder. I also happen to share my birthday with Kendall Jenner and Dolph Lundgren, who autocorrect decided to change to Adolf Lundgren. The only other fun fact I am most likely you know about November birthdays is that it is the month most serial killers are born in, at least according to a few studies and articles. Quote, Is it just a coincidence, or is there something sinister in the stars in the four weeks between Halloween and the December holiday season? According to the website Uberfax, 17 serial killers were born in November, compared with an average of 9 for other months, out of a total of more than 100 in the study. Those born in November are most likely to believe they get a raw deal in life. A 2005 study found that they grow up to be the most pessimistic. Let's take a look at some of the November babies who grow up to be notorious slayers. End quote. Just to name a few, we've got Ted Bundy, Charles Manson, the Angel of Death, Bell Gunness, aka the Black Widow, Dennis Nielsen, David Ray Parker, or the Toy Box Killer, and Rosemary West of the Fred and Rosemary West Killing Duo. How fancy is that? Sharing my birthday month with the worst of the worst. Between you and I, though, I secretly love it. And in honor of everything I have just mentioned, our subject today also happens to have been born in the month of November. My name is Eli, it's my birthday, and this is Murder in the Morning. My sources for today come from Murderpedia, Wikipedia, and most of it came from this article titled The Killing Spree That Transfixed a Nation by Leslie Wisham, or Wishman. Born on November 24th, 1938, Charles Raymond Starkweather was the fourth of seven children. His father, a carpenter with arthritis, was often unemployed, giving him much more time at home to neglect the children, of course. His mother, Helen, would later divorce Mr. Starkweather, stating cruelty as the reason. And then, to top it all off, Charles had been born with a mild birth defect, resulting in misshapen legs. Due to this, he was often the subject of bullying by his classmates and neighbors. But despite everything wrong in his life, Charles did his best to maintain a positive demeanor for as long as he could, looking for the positives among everything negative in his life. Soon, however, people began to notice a change in him. As he grew up, he became bigger than the insufferable bullies he endured in middle school. Quote, As he grew older and stronger, the only subject in which Starkweather excelled was the gym where he found an outlet for his rage against those who bullied him. Charles then began to bully those who had once picked on him. Eventually, he felt rage against anyone he disliked. Author Ginger Strand argues that his writings from prison suggest a strong element of class envy and bitterness. Starkweather went from being one of the most well-behaved teenagers in the community to one of the most troubled. His high school friend Bob Van Bush, Bob Van Bush, love that name, would later recall, he could be the kindest person you've ever seen. He'd do anything for you if he liked you. He was a hell of a lot of fun to be around too. Everything was just one big joke to him. But he had this other side. He could be mean as hell, cruel. If he saw some poor guy on the street who was bigger than he was, 
better looking or better dressed, he'd try to take the pa- he'd try to take the poor bastard down to his size. By the time Starkweather dropped out of school, his parents and family were reportedly afraid of him due to his vi- due to his violent outbursts. End quote. At the age of eighteen, Charles dropped out of high school and sought unemployment or er, <laughs> sought employment at a newspaper warehouse. I never understand why people drop out as a senior. You're just so, you just do it. You're so close. Just do it. Anyways, it was during this period at the warehouse where Charles met 13 year old Carol Ann Fugate. Now, I don't know the specifics of 1950 laws, but an 18 year old dating a 13 year old is weird and never a good idea. I remember this couple from my hometown. I don't remember their names, so I can't rat them out. Anyways, the girl was 15, I believe, when they started dating, and her boyfriend, a casual 22 years old. First of all, gross. Second of all, you'll never guess who set them up. Her mother. Her mom did. I hated it, and I hated seeing them in any public place just made me cringe. Anywho, Charles and Carol, they began to see each other every day, and he would let her do things her parents wouldn't, such as driving a car. She felt all this freedom with Charles, whether or not it was with good intentions. One day, Starkweather let Carol Fugate behind the wheel of his father's car and ended up crashing it. Charles was then kicked out by his father of their house as this would be the last straw for him. He was sick of the violent outbursts and he was not okay with him dating this young girl and letting her crash his car. Quote, Starkweather began developing a nihilistic worldview, believing that his current situation was the final determinant of how he would live the rest of his life while striving only to satisfy his biological needs and acquire power over others. He began plotting and settled on a personal philosophy. Dead people are all on the same level. End quote. I mean, technically, I suppose he is correct. If you, if you think about all the buried dead people. But wow, what an awful view of the world to have and especially only at 18 you're so young he would first act upon this new philosophy of his on november november 30th 1957 charles entered a service shop and was denied using a line of credit for some random product which really ticked him off he would return multiple multiple times throughout the day to the same shop acting strangely until he came back later in the evening one final time with a shotgun. Charles Starkweather ordered the cashier, Robert Covert, to give him all of the money and then forced him into his car, driving to, a, uh, driving to a remote area. Here, the two fought over the weapon for a short period before Charles regained control and shot Robert in the head multiple times. What he did with his body, it's unclear I was unable to find. But the murder ends up going cold, and Charles remains a free man. Then, the following year in 1958, his infamous murder spree began. Quote, On January 21st, 1958, Charles Starkweather went to Carol Fugate's home. Fugate's mother and stepfather, Velda and Marion Bartlett, told him to stay away. He fatally shot them, then clubbed to death their two-year-old daughter, Betty Jean. He hid the bodies in an outhouse and a chicken coop behind the house. Starkweather said that Carol was there the entire time, but she said that when she arrived home, Starkweather met her with a gun and said that her family was being held hostage. She said that Charles told her that if she cooperated with him, her family would be safe. Otherwise, they would be killed. The pair remained in the house until shortly before the police alerted by Fugate's suspicious grandmother, arrived on January 27th. When the police broke in, they found no one there and the house in in apparent order. 
A few days later, Charles's brother Rodney and his friend Bob Von Bush searched the house and surrounding premises, finding the stashed bodies. The police issued an alert to pick up both Starkweather and Fugate. End quote. First of all, I know I knew this because I researched it and wrote it, but can you imagine being the friend of of one of these two involved and you having to search the house and the outhouse and the chicken coop and you being the one to find these murdered family members, including a two-year-old girl? Mm. Now on the run, Charles Starkweather only continues to escalate. The pair drives to the home of a sweet 70-year-old man who offered to help the two with a car issue. Instead of thanking him, Charles shot the man in the back and, trigger warning for animals, he then proceeded to beat the man's dog to death with his shotgun. Fucking monster. Fleeing the area on foot this time, two local teenagers named Robert Jensen and Carol King stopped to give them a ride. Charles pulled the gun and forced Robert to drive to an abandoned area where the three of them got out and Carol Fugate stayed in the car. Charles then shot Robert and raped Carol King, shooting and killing her afterwards. Just a display of zero emotion. Once again, on the run in a stolen vehicle, this time Robert Jensen's, after brutally killing two teenagers, Charles and his girlfriend slash captive head towards an upper class area to hide. They knock on the door of Mr. Ward, a local businessman. The following day, he, his wife, and their maid are all found dead, stabbed to death. It's unclear how much Carol Fugate is involved throughout the entire murder spree. She, for the most part, has maintained her innocence since their capture, but Charles ever-changing stories sometimes include her as the killer. We'll cover it more near the end, but it was a very hard case to try since Carol is literally a mere 13 years old and was essentially kidnapped, whether or not she knew what had happened to her family. Anyway, back to the story before I get too sidetracked. As Charles and Carol continue this game of cat and mouse, the two come across a sleeping man inside his car along the freeway, Mr. Collison. Mr. Collison was awoken by Charles and told to get out of the car. When he refused, Charles Starkweather shot him multiple times in the car, killing the man. Quote, the man's car had a parking brake, which was something new to Starkweather. While he attempted to drive away, the car stalled because the brake had not been released. He tried to restart the engine, and a passing motorist, geologist Joe Sprinkle, what a wonderful name, Stop to help. Starkweather threatened him with a gun and an altercation ensued. I don't understand why he keeps trying to hurt these people that are trying to help him. At that moment, Natrona County Sheriff's Deputy William Rover arrived on the scene. Carol Fugate ran to him, yelling something to the effect of, It's Starkweather. He's going to kill me. Starkweather drove off, this time with the parking brake released and was involved in a car chase with three officers, Romer, Douglas Police Chief Robert Ainsel, and Converse County Cheryl Earl Heflin, all exceeding speeds of 100 miles per hour, or 160 kilometers per hour, for everyone else in the world. Fuck, I hate that I don't know the metric system. A bullet fired by Heflin shattered the windshield, and flying glass cut Starkweather deep enough to cause bleeding. He braked, stopped, surrendered, and was captured near Douglas County on January 29, 1958. Heflin said he thought he was bleeding to death. That's why he stopped. That's the kind of son of a bitch he is. Okie dokie. This is where the story becomes a bit convoluted and controversial, like how I use uncooked onion rings as ramekins. Initially, Charles claimed that Carol Fugate was, in fact, a captive. But over the next few weeks, his story began to change, and he would claim that she was a willing participant. A 13-year-old willing participant. As I said before, 
Fugate has always maintained that Charles threatened to kill her if she did not obey his demands. And one of the investigators on the case strongly opposed her, saying she had multiple opportunities to escape. But you have to remember, dude, she is 13 and he's 19 now. How do you expect her to, say, to handle the situation in any practical way whatsoever? The only issue with her story was she did, in fact, have newspaper clippings of her family's death from days prior, which showed that Carol knew about the murders. But it's like, yeah, OK, so she knows about her family's death. That only proves the point that Charlie will, in fact, kill her if she won't listen. I said, in fact, three times in that paragraph, and I promise I won't do it again. You could twist her words either way, I think. But I'm not sure you can qualify her as a willing participant. That is kidnapping. It seems very one-sided. Plus, she wasn't the one who planned on killing people ever. That was all Charles. He was the one who started this murder spree and took her with. Anyways, the two were tried separately. On May 23, 1958, Charles Starkweather was sentenced to death by an electric chair and was killed just over a year later in prison. Quote, Starkweather gave no last words, but in a letter from prison to his parents, wrote, Dad, I'm not real sorry for what I did, because for the first time, me and Carol had fun. I don't know why I gave him a Forrest Gump accent, but I think that's probably what he sounded like. Charles was reportedly indifferent about his impending death and had become resigned to his fate. End quote. I think that letter was just another way of him shifting the guilt to the 13-year-old Carol, saying she enjoyed it and had fun, which I don't believe, and what a loser. As for Carol, quote, Fugate was convicted as an accomplice and received a life sentence on November 21st, 1958. She was paroled in June of 1976 after serving 17 and a half years at the Nebraska Correctional Center for Women in York. After her release, she settled in Hillsdale, Michigan, end quote. In total, Charles was responsible for 11 deaths during his murder spree. His victims ranged from 2 years old to 70 years old to 70 years old. This massive range of ages and victims to me is what sticks out most concerning the difference between a spree killer and a serial killer. My train of thought has always been this. A serial killer will normally target a specific victim due to some underlying obsession or hatred, whereas a spree killer simply intends to inflict as much pain as possible in a short period of time. My curiosity got the best of me at the end of the story, and it turns out I was kind of right, just missing a few key pieces. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, The dictionary defines a serial killer as a person who kills more than one victim in more than one location in a very short period of time. But according to the FBI, that definition actually reflects the behavior of a spree killer. A spree killer is someone who kills two or more victims over a short period of time without a cooling off period, the FBI said. Spree killers do not resume their normal lives in between killings like serial killers do. The maximum duration bet between murders in a spree killing is generally considered to be seven days. Serial killers, on the other hand, may cool off for weeks, months, and in rare instances, even years between murders. The lack of a cooling off period is the difference between a spree killer and a serial killer, the FBI said. This is very different than serial killers who are much more likely to stalk and target complete strangers who somehow fulfill a deranged and secret fantasy that only they understand, end quote. I honestly don't know what's more scary. What's scarier? What's the scariest? Both are horrifying. I just thought that was interesting and you might like to hear a bit about it. Sorry, I got sidetracked again. The case of Charles Starkweather 
has since inspired many popular adaptations, maybe most notably the movie Natural Born Killers, starring Woody Harrelson, which I am going to watch this weekend. And that is all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm off to do birthday stuff by myself. My brother's in Boston. That's okay. I'll have fun. If you want to give me a birthday present, a follow or a like or anything would be cool. Alrighty. Have a blessed day, everyone. Bye-bye. Love you.